to another episode of Breezeway Productions, The Breeze, where today we are talking about The Walrus and the Whistleblower. It's a film that is uh, screening this year at the 2020 Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival. And today we have director Natalie Bubo. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about The, the Walrus and the Whistleblower. The Walrus and the Whistleblower is a dramatic tale about an, ex an eccentric main character who uh, used to be uh, a trainer at a place called Marineland in Niagara Falls, Canada. And he became known for his relationship with a walrus, of all things, ended up becoming this viral media sensation in the early days of social media. And uh, then broke news again a couple of years later um, for being a whistleblower. So he left his dream job um, with allegations of animal abuse and ended up triggering a huge um, media expose that went around the world and that he's still living the repercussions of today. Yeah, it follows quite a fascinating journey of, uh, well, first learning about your main subject and seeing where his life uh, was in this uh, marine land. I hope I'm able to, uh, to say the name because it's very touchy-feely with what's been going on with the battle between marine land and uh, this gentleman. Um, what, uh, what was his first and last name, uh, name again? Phil Demers. Phil Demers, who uh, is quite an interesting character, as you said, where he really fell in love with these walruses and that you really get attached to, um, to, to, to them as you, as you meet them. I remember there was Apollo, there was Zeus, there's Buttercup, and, um, and the main one that he really fell in love with, uh, what, was, what was the main walrus's name? Smooshy. Smooshy. So the fight is really for Smooshy because uh, you learn about how he was imprinting towards, towards the walrus and that, that he was considered uh, the walrus's mother. So it was really like a family bond. And you can see in the, in the footage that you show that uh, there really is a lot of love there between trainer and animal. Um, so he really had get, garnered a lot of passion towards you know, going after the uh, marine land and then he brought other whistleblowers with him. How did the, the subject come to you and what made you really want to build on it and create this documentary? Well, I've been following the story online for quite some time, several years, and um, mostly because I knew Phil when I was growing up. I, I, you know, he was a friend of my brother's. And so when he first became uh, known for his relationship with Smooshy, I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, I was watching him um, on talk shows and, you know, there was a, like our, our national news network went to film with him. Um, but then when he became a whistleblower a couple of years later, I, it really twigged for me. I was like, Ooh, this would make a great film because here he was as a poster child for this industry, for the captivity of, of marine mammals, um, as far as the bond that's possible between humans and animals and this really positive, lovely, loving relationship. And then all of a sudden he flips, or at least that's what it looks like on the outside, and starts talking about these allegations and what's really going on there and how we really shouldn't have these animals in captivity at all. So I knew there was a great arc and a great transformation story, but I didn't do anything about it. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. One is um, I was a bit nervous about making a film about someone I knew when I was a kid. Uh, I'd always worked on films about other people and other things that were kind of far away, safer in a, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and also I'd been to Marineland when I was a kid. I knew people who worked there. And so I wasn't sure if I wanted to get involved in my hometown's business, really. Um, but what ended up happening is it just, it was one of those things that was meant to be, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger in my head. And as a story, it just kept thickening and thickening. Um, and then eventually I saw Phil testify at our federal government yeah. and it was a video that went out online. And I was like, I got to do something about this because <laughs> it's like, it had just gotten to such a point inside of me that I just, I knew all of a sudden that it was a film waiting to happen and I had to, I had to grab it. I think that the film would really be a great watch for activists that might be feeling a little 
down and out after fighting and you know boots on the ground doing everything that they can and they feel a little demoralized your film is very invigorating to show that boots on the ground does work and that you can really see a lot of momentum from making some noise when you see an issue that needs to be addressed so i thought that that was uh, a very cool theme that i noticed from a lot of the documentaries in this festival and yours in particular was was a very good one um, when you were working with the, uh, the government and you really had to get into the legal uh, showcasing of how the Canadian system works, did you find that, that that was an easy process to get into and that you were able to document it? Or did you find some red tape with that? Because you were really dealing with some, some heavy measures. Oh yeah, I got amazing access actually. As far as um, in Canada anyway, normally, uh, you know, parliamentary access or, or you know, getting access to politicians and behind the scenes stuff is not that um, easy. Um, but I had wonderful allies um, behind the scenes, um, inside government actually, people who knew the process and knew people and yeah. knew how I could legitimately get access to important scenes and important moments in the development of the legislation. So with their help, I was able to knock on the right doors. And um, also, you know, I, I was making a film for our public broadcaster. So there's a certain amount of um, like a, a, an excellent reputation that comes with that. Um, I wasn't just, um, you know, sort of an amateur walking around with a camera, I had a professional crew. Um, I, I've trained as a journalist. I worked inside this public broadcaster for many years. Yeah. So I had um, both the connections, but also I think the credibility to be able to access high levels of government. So. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And listen, that, that's amazing. They're good allies to have, especially when you're working on these types of documentaries. Friendlies that are willing to give their time, the testimonials to add to your film makes it that much more powerful while you're watching it. Um, a lot of the other things I found powerful were your archival footage that you were able to get and that I'm sure that those were shot on some very old school cameras from, from way back when. So you're really watching a lot of footage from, uh, from his earlier years when he was before he was a whistleblower, so to say. How was it like when you had to go through the, the treasure trove of videos from the past where you see, you know, the walruses and the other animals and the trainers? What was that experience like for you putting that together? Oh, it was wonderful because um, there's only so far you can go without archive. Um, you know, there's a great, there, there are a lot of great creative ways of getting around it. Um, mm -hmm. But when you don't have to, um, and you can really show things how they were, um, then it's, it's wonderful because the audience, for example, I think can really connect to the main character and to the cause in large part because of that archive um, that where you see Phil interacting with Smooshy. And most of that actually comes from our public broadcaster. So, you know, Phil having become this personality earlier in his um, career when he wasn't a whistleblower yet, um, beckoned the media. And so there were all these media outlets that were allowed to film at Marine Land in happier days when Phil and Smooshy were the, you know, the emblems of how great captivity can be. Yeah. Uh, so that footage um, I was able to get and, and license through our public broadcaster, which was a gold mine. And so f seeing that and seeing like how loving he was with this walrus and how the walrus looked back at him. Uh, I just, I remember sitting there in the edit suite going, okay, I think we'll, we'll be able to do this. Did you feel any level of uh, anxiety or danger while you were making this documentary because of the, the subject sensitivity? Uh, you know, you're, you're basically, David and Goliath was used a couple of times while you're seeing, and you're working with, with David to, bring down Goliath. So did, like, did you feel any kind of nervousness while you were making it? And, uh, you know, obviously you made it and I think it's fantastic, but did you, were you feeling a little stressed while you were doing it? Um, I was feeling a ton of anxiety um, on and off through the entire process. But just to correct you, I wasn't working with David to bring down Goliath. I was oh. trying to really, um, paint this portrait of what it's like to be David and what it's like to be Goliath. And, to, to try to actually show the, the, the battle, to get behind the battle lines and show what it's like to be in this kind of conflict. Um, so, but deal, having an, an organization like Marineland involved in, in anything is anxiety inducing. Um, you know, they've launched uh, 
uh, roughly 12 lawsuits um, against other people and uh, media outlets since Phil has come out. So that's um, something that you definitely think about. Um, but also um, working with a character like Phil is complicated because, you know, he's a strong, willed, difficult, um, but vulnerable and sweet, but angry and this and that, and he's a lot of different things. And so I was kind of caught between a lot of strong personalities. Yeah. Thank goodness I have one too. So, <laughs> so I could kind of stand up to all of that. Um, but it was a hugely intense film. I got to be honest with you. You know, I yeah. worked long hours. It was very um, kind of an emotional process to bring this thing to, to, to the screen. And, uh, and I, and I had to really keep my center um, throughout all of it because I knew how important the story was. I knew that it would be defensible. I had a great legal team. I had a great support team. Um, you know, I have a great broadcaster behind me. So, uh, but, but it, it was a, the ride of a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, I was I was happy to see that that you included the the Joe Rogan experience when they when when I, uh, when he went on the podcast and he talked about it. he's like I was getting all these tweets about it and I brought you on because you know this is really garnering some steam so I wanted you to get on get on the waves and talk about it so he was getting a lot of uh, a lot of press and it really kind of rose to the top and um, you know then viewers will have to watch it to see what else happens. So I, I thought that it was, was fantastic. And where would people go to, to check this out? Do you have a website that you can go to see the trailer and uh, like the poster for it and, and uh, updating current events on uh, the walrus and the whistleblower? Yes, uh, well, our handle is um, at www.doc and the website is walrusandwhistleblower.com. Awesome, well, I'll be sure to make uh, send that out so people can uh, 